The next talk is given remotely by Professor Dejan Popovic from Belgrade. Here I am. <laughs> he's a member of the Serbian Academy of Sciences and Arts, and he's also a member of the Academy of Engineering Sciences in uh, Serbia. Since the last 40 years, he has been teaching as a professor at the University of Belgrade, the University of Alberta, Canada, the University of Miami, Florida, and the University of Aalborg in Denmark. Uh, good morning, or, yeah, good morning, that's a good time. Um, I was asked to, you know, step in because Lana, she, Lana popovic Panenski, who is actually the owner of many things and one of the main collaborators, or main collaborators from Belgrade, with Lyon and that excellent group that I love collaborating. But she prefers to listen and she doesn't like very much to give presentations. So she said, can you do that? And I said, no, I can't. And here I'm doing it. Okay, anyway, uh, as you heard from Amin, uh, I have a lot of experience in this field, although my first initial education came from mechanics, and I was designing initially the exoskeletons and artificial legs. So, but throughout my uh, entire career, I would say from 1975, I'm in the domain of developing and testing various technologies that can be used for restoring movements in persons who have either loss an extremity, so being a prosthesis, or who lost the function by having a central nervous system lesion. So many of these things are built, like this is always in engineering labs, because we come with an excellent idea, and uh, we try to implement this idea, but when we try to implement this idea, we come to a solution. That solution comes to the clinic, in clinic it is, excuse me, it is tested, and once it is tested, after a few days, after we leave the lab, this device ends up on the shelf and collects dust. Uh, one of the reasons for that is that actually, uh, in order to do something which will be really used in rehabilitation, we have to start from the user needs. And when I say user needs, I mean patients, they have to tell us what they need. Therapists, they have to tell us what they can use. Clinicians, they have to tell us, is that really worth using? And uh, healthcare providers, they have to say, yes, we want to pay for that. So in this chain, from an idea that can be very good, through that follows what I just said, ideas of the stakeholders, we can possibly come to solutions. But even if we start from the engineering, there are a few problems that we have that we're facing that actually functional electrical stimulation, or how it is called often, neuromuscular electrical stimulation, is not necessarily applicable for all what we want to do. So we have to understand a little bit physiology, or maybe more than a little bit of physiology, and to know also something about pathologies, so to be able to understand that. And once we know that, we can possibly find ways how the new technology, which is advancing extremely fast with new materials, microcomputers, minimization, excellent power sources, that all starts to be extremely effective. Anyway, so that's the reason for the title, Functional Equipment Stimulation, Bottlenecks and Available Solutions. What I will be try I've tried to do, and I'll be talking exclusively today on one aspect of that, and this is assisting individuals who have a spinal cord injury, spinal cord lesion, uh, how they can possibly, uh, we can assist them in trying to stand up and walk. So what happens is uh, if there is uh, a lesion, and that lesion can be in the brain or it can be in the spinal cord, and as I said, I'll be talking about the spinal cord, what happens is some of the muscles that are below the lesion, they are paralyzed. And because they are paralyzed, everything which is linked to them is sleeping. So although there are many connections that are still there between the muscles and the spinal cord, this is all sleeping. Uh, as you will see in one of the next slides, uh, it is very rare that actually everything is paralyzed, and that is the complete lesion. So what we can do is, we can use functional electrical stimulation, and by using electrical stimulation, we animate the muscles, and once we animate the muscles, that actually is a great motivation for a person to use the other preserved sensory motor mechanisms, and once they use that, we are actually providing signals to the brain. So we are activating our muscles, doing a work, from doing a function, or getting a function done, and our brain is participating in that in two ways. The brain is learning what is still available, the brain is learning how to use something which is stimulated, and the brain is sending signals to the preserved mechanism. So what 
So here there is a list of contributions that I wouldn't go in detail at this point because I will come back later on uh, when I'm analyzing some of the results. But today, if you go into literature, and there are thousands of papers uh, which are published about functional electrical stimulation, it has been demonstrated that if you stimulate muscle, you can keep preserve the bulk of the muscle, you can build up the strength if this muscle already lost the strength, and uh, in that way, by since you're moving the extremities to the function, you can preserve and prevent the loss of a range of movement in the joints that are there. By activating muscle, one thing is happening, you have an increased blood circulation because muscles are pumping the blood to the vascular systems in which all assist. Uh, there is the most important thing in that is actually that by activating muscles, you're activating atherin fibers, and you activate these atherin fibers, so these are fibers fibers that are going to the brain. So you are providing an external signal which is not really integrated into biological schema, but you're actually activating muscles and they are sending from the proprioceptive signals that are there. In some cases, they can decrease the plasticity. In all cases, you can decrease frequency and strength of puzzles if, if they exist. In some cases, there are carryover effects but they're not very often exposed in individuals up with a spinal cord injury. And of course, because of the activity and eliminating no use, you postpone the secondary complication of paralysis. I'll just mention one. If you allow someone to stand and you perform that on a daily basis, then the frequency of urinary infections will be decreased for several times. If you have individual standing for some time, then you're providing the actual loading of the bones and entering into loss of the bone mass so there are several other things that are there, but I wouldn't go there. So what you'll see here is something that is historical. Uh, I learned a lot about electrical stimulation in Ljubljana, where this started, and it was Ljubljana Center, was a leading center in the world made by the decision of the National Institute of Health, the National Institute of Disability Research in the United States, and they invested millions of dollars to do that. So uh, what we did is we participated in some of these research studies, and this was recorded in the Belgrade Hearp Center. That's a patient who has a complete paralysis. And you can see he's standing even on one leg or he's standing on both legs, right? Just by stimulating the quadriceps muscle. And if you stimulate the peroneal nerve, you can activate also and have something which is a withdrawal reflex. If you combine these two things, so you stimulate the extensors on one leg and you stimulate the withdrawal reflex on the other leg, and you combine them from left to right leg, and this is all controlled by left and right switches, then you get something which is an ambulation, which with the walker, with wheels, works very well. This development was done by Alice Kral, who was just in the movie, the sort of showing that, and one of his colleagues, very close colleagues, that they bite. Both of them are still active. They are in Ljubljana, they're members of the Academy of Sciences. They are not really active in electrical stimulation, but very much active in science. So in 80s, they built that, and they wrote a book in 1989 which includes data, about 120 patients that are like the one that you're watching here. So there was a lot of research done in 80s in using electrical stimulation, how to assist individuals. And as you can see, on the street, you cannot see a single person walking just with electrical stimulation. So there is where we come to the question how to bring FES to the practice. So if you look into the spinal cord and a lesion, you see one cyst. So there was an injury in the spinal cord, that's the left uh, radiographical would get. But if you follow the top right panel, what you can see there, you can see the changes that occur in the spinal cord because of the lesion. And at the beginning, this there was nothing. Then you start having problems, and at the end, after some time, you see that there is basically a hole in the spinal cord. And if you look into the bottom uh, panel there, you can see where are the tracks ascending and descending tracks in the spinal cord. So if you combine the right bottom uh, in the top panel and the lower one, you can see that some of these zones are overlapping, meaning that many of the ascending and descending tracts are not existing anymore. So there is no communication between the brain and everything which is above the lesion and the structures which are below the lesion. But what you see here is if this is happening at the cervical level, then you have a tetraplegia. If it is happening at the thoracic, you have a still tetraplegia and paraplegia, and then if it's happening in the sacral region, you have paraplegia, but this last case is when persons are have a flaccid paralysis, and flaccid paralysis means 
that they do have muscles, but these muscles are not innervated. Now, what is the reason that I put this slide in? A typical uh, division is that you write, and uh, I have a wrong spelling here, it's not complete, it's complete lesion. So complete lesion is HIA, meaning that the transaction is complete, so there's no communication. Uh, the incomplete means that you have Asia B and C is in classification, meaning that there is some communication between the upper molar neuron and through the lesion. Dr. Dimitrievich, who is an expert who started this, he's in Houston. Uh, and he built the, their neural center for many years, still active in his 85, 6, whatever. And he came with a term very recently, which is called discomplete lesion. What's a discomplete lesion? Most of patients today, because they receive excellent care at the moment of injury, what happened with them, they are diagnosed as Asia A as a complete lesion. So if they are complete lesion, there should not be, shouldn't be any carrier of effects, and there shouldn't be any other changes. But he came with the term this complete lesion. So if you test them, they look like complete, but actually there are still some connections that can be activated and that may work very well. So meaning is, we can go very close to that. So we have a person sitting in a wheelchair and we want to help that. We want to raise them up. And if we look, want to see how that works and how that operates, then we can see very nicely that in, uh, in the legs, what we have to do is we have to activate the leg muscles during the gait. And if you want to do that, we see that we have many muscles that are contributing to the hip and knee extension flexion uh, and as well ankle. We have to control as well muscles in the paraspinal muscles, which is typically preserved because the injury is somewhere in the thoracic lesion. But there are many muscles. So press the arrow. So we cannot stimulate all the muscles. So uh, various systems have been designed to actually do and try to assist people. And the whole project from Ljubljana uh, was moved to Chicago. So Alex Kraj in the 80s, he moved to Chicago and he was working with an excellent, fantastic engineer and designer and uh, researcher and scientist, Graupi. And Graupi started a study and this study ended up with the development of a system that was transferred to the company Signetics a system we call Parastep. So Parastep system is sold to individuals with paraplegia, and it is approved only for use as a therapeutic device uh, for the price of about 15,000 US dollars or something like that. The person gets 16 hours of therapy. So he gets the rolling walker, and that's the performance that they get. This movie was recorded in Miami. All the cables and the engineer uh, they are not part of the walking exercise, they are part of our research that we did in order to build the system which will work better and now individuals to walk better. So, but if you can see, this is a time-consuming, very hard work. Patients in Miami, they use it very well, they were, they were extremely motivated. The typical person in a place like Miami or uh, California is a young adult. So, that's the only device that was ever really FDA approved. Uh, for the use, and it was not sold for home use, but exactly only for therapeutic use and research uses. We continued working on this because this hand control doesn't work well and built an extremely nice and efficient automatic control. And you can see uh, the same patient that you saw before, but now working with automatic control. So we're recording signals from the knee joint, hip joint, and we have insoles that are instrumented with four sensors and this person is walking completely with automatic control. We made these individuals actually walk up to speeds of more than 1.2 meters per second, which is very reasonable walking of speed, but they were not really enthusiastic about this walking because they couldn't integrate really the movement of the trunk and upper arms in the synchrony with lower legs. So they ended up in actually walking slower. Slow walk is uh, very fatiguing, uh, extension phases are long, and because of that, after some time, they decided actually that this automatic control was not really making a change compared to the hand control. Cleveland Group did absolutely best work possible. Byron Marsley and his colleagues, they implanted systems instead of using surface stimulation that I was showing so far. And they implanted up to 64 electrodes and used a 16-channel stimulator. The stimulator was external. The virus were going through the skin, that was the percutaneous system. Rudy Koberic, an excellent engineer and programmer, 
he was the one who was setting these profiles for stimulation. So if you look at the top graph, you see black uh, lines or black fields. These black fields are showing when the muscles are stimulating, and the white is when there is no stimulation. And as I said, 64 channels, meaning this is 32 channels per leg. Some of these channels were connected to work at the same time, so 16 channels stimulated. The stimulator was external, it was reared of the belt, and they had in total 14 patients who worked with that. The project lasted for several years, and the, the end, because of, it was a Veterans Administration funded project, they had to stop it in a way that I very much dislike, because the project said that at the end of the study they will pull out all the virus, which they did. So from individuals who were walking nicely, they made them back into wheelchair, because once the virus were pulled out, of course, they were again in where they were. So there, are no, there were no carry over effects whatsoever. So this study and the development was continued. And uh, one of the persons who participated in the studies, who started his research, with Bor, Myra Marsley and Rudy Kuberich, is Ron Triolo, who is still very active in Cleveland, the Case Western Reserve University. And what they do did is actually they replaced the technology that was available at that time with a device that was developed for upper extremities. The device for upper extremities is a freehand system. Freehand system is a system that supports up to eight channels of stimulation with whatever epimysial or intramuscular electrodes. And they have one of these devices in, in, uh, implanted in the left side, the second one in the right side. So the complete is stimulator plus the electrodes, everything is implanted. There is a telemetric communication between the external units where the batteries are to send the power and control signals to the implants. And they made few individuals walk. And as you can see here, this was in 2009. This will, you, will continue and you will see one patient working with a system in combination with an external skeleton at the end of my talk. With all that, we actually came to the point that it is possible to make paraplegic individuals and incomplete tetraplegic stand up and walk. But, what turns out to be the problem is, the first one is fatigue. Because the periods of stimulation of the quadriceps and gluteus are very long. And through that very long period, there is a fatigue and the muscles after a minute or so cannot support the patient to stand. The second thing which is there in some of the cases, especially at the lower thoracic lesions at TH11, TH12, TH so thoracic 11 and 12, where patients still have innovation of the muscle of the leg, it actually increases the plasticity. In the patients which are above that, it decreases the period. There is no system that can actually help them to stand just on their legs, so they have to use arms to, for the support, with meaning using either crutches, which is difficult, or some type of walker. The other thing which was there is, as I mentioned in previously, we, have a, we had a problem where we made automatic control, so automatic control is not really integrated into what the person has. So there is one rhythm of biological control and a second rhythm of artificial control. They have to be integrated in order to do that. Patients do not feel what's happening in their legs. So they don't know what the legs are doing. Since they don't know what they're doing, they have to watch their legs what happens. You cannot really walk if you're watching your legs. When you're walking, you have to walk, uh, look in front of you and plan what you want to do. Look at all the things that are on your way. And if you put your head and you're just raising your head down by watching your legs, your posture doesn't really allow you to walk, walk normally. So crouch gait, which this is, is not efficient and it doesn't work in a good way. So the feedback, and my website was one of the ones who started first using that, is potentially you can stimulate or you can do something else to assist individuals so that they know on, on, based on the information that they get what the legs are doing and learn how to use that. People learn very fast how to use the sensory information. Uh, one thing that I'm saying here is since FES is not good because of fatigue and other, it might be good to combine this with some type of robots, exoskeletons to see. Finally, we faced a situation where, for example, when we had female and people who were, wanted to be look nice, they hated surface electrodes. They didn't like that their legs looked like a, you know, a puppet, and they didn't like all that. So this gadget tolerance is not really good. For the therapy, it was okay, but for using that on a daily basis, it's like a this didn't work so well. 
First, just a few words about fatigue and how this can be overrun. So fatigue is caused because there's a reverse recruitment over if you stimulate with electronic electrical stimulations and compare that with the natural. Uh, stimulation of all the motor fibers in electrical stimulation with all versions is synchronous. So all motor units are synchronous, synchronous and then you must stimulate them at a frequency which is at least 20 hertz, which is very fatigue. There is something which is called neuromuscular fatigue. This is because you are actually fatiguing the synaptic connections. And finally, there is a metabolic fatigue when you are uh, fatigue, fatiguing the muscle by pumping in too much calcium, and that doesn't work very well. We tried to uh, resolve the problem like many other, and this was the study which was done by Lana and uh, Levisha Maleshevich, some of the students who were there. And what we did is we said, okay, we should try to mimic what the nature does. So instead of having two electrodes that are activating the complete muscle, in the math, in the math that I just mentioned, this is synchronous stimulation of fibers, we have several channels. And each of the electrodes that you see on the left leg is stimulating one portion of the muscle. So in that way, you're stimulating and activating only some of the motor units at each point. In that way, you can actually decrease the stimulation. You're not decreasing the stimulation. So each of, so if you look at the muscle itself, the muscles see the stimulation from 20 hertz, as for example, 10 hertz, but you actually stimulate at that lower frequency. If you look at the right panel, you can see that the fatigue was postponed for almost 100%. So the period of stimulation that you actively get the force is doubled. Uh, that you can see best if you look at the dashed line. Look at the dashed line, so if you have a maximum force, which was triggered about five seconds from the onset of stimulation, the force starts declining, and it crosses the value of 70% after about 25 seconds with synchronous stimulation, and it comes down with about 60 seconds in the asynchronous stimulation. So in that way, you can postpone fatigue, but you cannot eliminate it. It is still short. 50, 60 seconds is not sufficiently long if you have to, if you want to have a person. So other things and other methods should be resolved if you want to have really a practical system. This technology that we built up uh, comes as a, as a follow up of things that other people did in research. And that has to do with if you use this multi uh, electrode system, which you can replace with one electrode which has several pads, so you have a multi pad, so like a, an array electrode which is all built into one substrate, and you start using this distributed asynchronous stimulation. What, mean, what it means, distributed asynchronous, means that you're stimulating only some of the pads at different times with a lower frequency. If you look at the left bottom, you will see there are some numbers on these electrodes, and these numbers of the electrodes, they are actually pointing what this specific electrode does. So these numbers relate to the uh, digits in the hand, and they talk about wrists, this is shown on the wrist. So with that, you can actually generate two things. First of all, postpone fatigue, like I just described in the previous slides, but at the same time, you can get the selective stimulation. So this is one lesson that we learned through the research and it has been implemented and already exists. So multi-pad stimulation is effective. Uh, with the materials that are available today, that might work very well. And there are several companies and several developments and research centers that are looking into use of multi band electrodes and trying to use the distributed asynchronous stimulation. The other thing which you can do also with electrical stimulation, this is to decrease, eliminate plasticity by inhibiting. So what you see here, you see the same person uh, after intervention and before intervention. So before the instrument, you see the plasticity. So this is the test, which is called pendulum test, and you can see that the leg doesn't fall down, based. and now this is after the intervention. This specific intervention is described in publication that is listed at the bottom, is actually stimulating uh, very specifically uh, the circuits at, that are in the spinal cord at the neck level. So you have a galvanic stimulation at the neck level, and by stimulation of a gal galvanic, you decrease the plasticity. But that you can still not do with peripheral F, FES, which would be extremely effective. But this is, as you can see, so there are methods how you can inhibit that, inhibit the circuitry, which is actually causing plasticity. These are two of the elements that I showed. 
The most important element of using functional electrical stimulation is actually that by providing the afferent input, uh, the brain is learning and this brain is reorganizing the neural networks that are within the scene. And it maximizes the use because uh, persons, they know what they want and they can use their uh, brain functions, or the cognitive functions, actually to retrain that. And this is combined with the center of information of what's happening with the leg. So with this modified natural neural network in the CNS, which is called cortical plasticity, and it was described many, many years ago, it, there are several developments. But what is absolutely necessary for that is that electrical stimulations need to be incorporated into a functional exercise. So electrical stimulation per se, just turn it on and off, is not contributing to the development of because this cortical plasticity means that we develop new schemas on how to use your extremities. So with all that is, uh, the benefits that I already started is well, things that are happening to the FES, it prevents the disuse atrophy, it improves skin plasticity, it decreases plasticity, because if you're standing for some time, it prevents prevent urinary tract infections, improve functioning of internal organs, it definitely prevents contractures because you are moving joints to the movement and improves metabolic functions. Uh, contributes to the development of new strategies, I explained. Uh, it contributes to the cortical plasticity, plasticity, and with all that, there is this bold, it improves the quality of life. An important element is, it doesn't improve the quality of life of every single person that you use for that. So there must be something that the person is motivated to see. So a patient needs to see that there is an improvement. Stronger muscles, better look, uh, better functioning, and better inclusion in activity of daily living. So that's definitely there. There are some limitations that I already mentioned. So there's fatigue, uh, muscles that are stimulated, they cannot produce the same force as a healthy muscle can do. It is not possible to stimulate muscles that are deep or the nerves that are deep with surface stimulation, you can do it with implants with difficulties. In some patients, there is unpleasant sensation, so that needs to be considered. Dunning and duffing of the surface stimulation system is not optimized in this way. And finally, there is an insufficient integration of the ability. So there are some technical problems, and on the side of technical problems, there are some <coughs> physiological problems. And these physiological problems are the first one. So fatigue, insufficient muscle strength, and uh, insufficient integration. The other are technological changes. Anyway, so in order to uh, eliminate some of these uh, problems that we have with electrical stimulation, and that has been introduced many years ago, is to use something which is called a hybrid assistive system. A hybrid assistive system is a combination where you activate the muscles by electrical stimulation, and you use an external skeleton of a specific type that you need for a person, which will provide functions that will be of interest. So, the first power nerve skeleton that was ever developed was developed by one extremely efficient scientist, Miomiro Kovratovich, who came with this idea, which is zero moment point, and he built the first exoskeleton ever. And the movie you see is 1972. So this is a complete paraplegic patient, and you can see the person walking, but you don't see is a very, very big computer and power source is there. The versions that were made of that were with uh, pneumatic actuators, with hydraulic actuators, with electrical. So this system, this is Bukovatovich who is standing on the side, but you can see him. So the exoskeleton works on its own. It has the stability on its own. Uh, you see the actor. And now you see the person, patient walking in the device. So there were several versions of that. This is something that is hanging in the Museum of Robotics in Boston, it brings in the Museum of Robotics in Russia. And some of the principles that were developed there, and the specific one is called zero moment point. It's used in basically any bipedal machine to walk today. And that, is, that relates to the principle which is used to make the machine stable at different paces. Now, of course, that works very well when you have just the exoskeleton, when, have, when you have a person in, you can see that you still need a hand support, a rolling walker, or something else to make it run. We continue working with that, and, but at the same time, other people think we should, they should do it differently. And there were different machines, and this is one of the best developments by local uh, company called Comrade Switzerland, work from Etihad Zurich, 
And so what they came with is a Locomat machine, which is an excellent gait trainer. The gait trainer supports the body, uh, move it up and down, left and right, in the rhythm of walking, moves the hip, moves the knee, and doesn't do anything with the ankle. There is just a rubber support which pulls those up. So there is no control of the ankle. This system was distributed to many places. It has a nice price, which is somewhere between 250,000 and 500,000 euros. Uh, it is used for children. It is a sign that you have a rehab center, which runs very nice. One thing that I should mention is, if you look at the carryover effect, there are very little. And if you look on a daily effect, then that means that the person should have that for everyday use, which is not uh, really possible. So there is a limitation of using of an exoskeleton of this type. So the alternative of having a machine like that is to have actually an exoskeleton which is portable. And you see one of the developments that comes out from the work of Kazaruni in at Berkeley University with their bleach bionics and other systems. So the rewalk was built and made by the rewalk company running to this once more. Uh, and you see one lady here. Things that are not really nice when people make these movies for is this lady, she has a perfect balance with her body. She does not need anything for control of her ankles. So it is very questionable that she really needs such a complicated system. But this doesn't mean that this is a bad device. I think it's just over uh, advocating the effectivity of use because if you select a person who doesn't need it, the only thing for a healthy person to show that, then it only shows that it doesn't prevent the person to do what this person can do without the system. But definitely this is one of the developments that is worth looking at. So what we are talking now here, these were just the exoskeletons without stimulation, and I started talking about the hybrid system. So with hybrid systems, we can do much better with that. This is one of the first systems ever made. So that's a system that I built many years ago, and that's a complete paraplegic person who has a six channel of electrical stimulation and has an orthosis with a spring mechanism and a brake on the orthosis the left side because we were not able to control efficiently the left side, you don't see the right side uh, where this is. So we made it that it is really can be used out of the lab. And he was one of six patients who used that for a period of six months. Unfortunately, the technology at that time was not really good enough. And we had many technical problems with the sensors and other things to make it work very well. The other thing with the system that we have here, which was a self-feeding modular orthosis, we, we didn't really have a good control of hips. And because of the hips, when you have a slightly different patient, it doesn't work very well. And I faced this problem afterwards when I started using it. You see a young gentleman here that was in Edmonton, in Canada, and the person behind there is a fantastic scientist, Richard Stein, who is one of the creators of many fantastic things in this field, but also in theory. So you saw him with electrical stimulation, and you saw how the stimulation does the work. And this is on the same day, five minutes later, he has reciprocating gait orthosis controlling hips, and he has anchor foot orthosis, and you can see this person walking nicely. This young gentleman plus the 11 other, they use the running fluid once more. So in 11 other, uh, pardon, five other, they use that on a daily basis to go into school for a couple of years. Every single child that we have in that program actually stopped using at the time of puberty because they discovered that this is not really doesn't fit into their life program. Now, I mentioned before, this is Ron Triol on the right, and the patient, uh, complete uh, paraplegic patient, with uh, eight-channel stimulation implanted in every leg and with an orthosis. This was recorded in 2013, and I've seen some movies afterwards that don't look much better than this. But obviously, this is one of the trends, how to combine the electrical stimulation to provide all the benefits that stimulation does, and how to add to this an external skeleton to provide functions that functional electric stimulation cannot do. So this talk was meant actually to talk about ease, to have a practical device to get everything on the FES to work up, uh, efficiently. Uh, implant these systems are fine, they're expensive, there is always a risk of implants. So if we can stay with surface stimulation, that will be very effective, especially during the phase when the patient is discovering and learning how effective this is for that use. So how we can bring it to practice? And there is a nice word, the solution is on the way. And there is a company, 3F, Fabricanto Faber, which is linked to Lana Popovic, the co-owner. So what was happen what happened is uh, the company built a stimulator, which is called Modimo, two versions with four and eight channels. 
there is an AFU, which is an acronym from anti fatigue unit, uh, which distributes the simulation and, allow, and allows selective simulation of, of the LO. There is a software with the user interface, and because I'm talking about the gates, uh, the company built also the insoles, which are instrumented with robust industrial sensors that work as a, for sensor-driven control, and there is a software which tells and it automatically sets the program, uh, which can be used for assisting the game. So, what this is, so the solution is coming, and the Fit Fabricant of Power is not the only company. There are others who are developing on that. But with, I think that this is one of the better solutions that we may have in the future. So, having multi-channel stimulation, having anti-fatigue units, and having a software which is adaptable, sensor-driven, most likely will be a solution to improve the FES. Combine this with some light exoskeletons will be a solution which will make a difference in the life of patients with paraplegia. And here I will conclude. Thanks. Thank you very much, Diane. Uh, we move to questions now. Um, hello, Leon. Thank you very much for your presentation. I have a general question about uh, hybrid assistive systems for upper limbs. As you know, there are exoskeletons like uh, Armin for arm exoskeletons. And what are your comments about those systems and clinical uh, benefits for the systems? Uh, for upper extremities that I didn't touch today at all, uh, there are two questions. Exoskeletons are extremely effective and then can be used for the control of the arm movements. Controlling the shoulder movement with electrical stimulation is extremely difficult. It was tackled by the Cleveland group, Hunter Pickham and his colleagues, and it never worked very well. So there are quite a few researchers, and I think it's at least 10 years of development that happened at the Case Western Reserve University, which never ended with a good function. Controlling of the elbow is somewhat simpler, and that may work with electrical stimulation, although uh, in the case of injuries which are uh, on the dark felt plexus, very often you have denervated muscle, and if you have a denervated muscle, then the stimulation wouldn't work. So that's one. Opposite side, using exoskeleton for controlling grasp and hand function is the last thing that I would do in my life. There is no practical system that can use and that you can effectively use because if you use your hands for whatever, drinking, eating, then you have to wash your hands. You, I'm just looking to these days when we are just spraying alcohol over our hands for COVID problems and things like that. So uh, combination of having a device which is good for manipulation, something which controls the shoulder joint specifically, may be an excellent system. So the one that you mentioned that comes from Ocoma as well uh, is a reasonable device, but it is too robust, it's too complicated at this point. So having some soft actuation, which is on the way, is most likely to be the solution. The solution that was built by Milos Popovic in Toronto, uh, that's the system which is called MindMove, uh, is actually a, a nice exercise device which may help. But this all deals with the category of patients that you want to use. Arm assists are much more important for people after stroke because developing the control of upper extremities is very important for stroke patients, especially if from their dominant arm is affected. So, to conclude the uh, answer, so it's a good combination, but only if you are interested in actually controlling the shoulder. And if we can have soft taker, then we have much better solution. The other complexity that comes with that, it's very difficult to control because you have two parallel systems. One skeleton, which is the actual robot, and the other skeleton, which is the arm. So, uh, synchronizing these two moments, rotating about different axes, is not the easiest task. That's the reason that they actually control the position of the forearm, because then you have this flexibility. Because if you are to control only the elbow position, uh, the upper arm position, then it will work even more difficult because of the problem of synchronous or getting to act new rotations to operate about two different acts. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Dan. Thank you very much for an excellent talk. Um, I have a question concerning uh, what you feel um, uh, is there a future for or could be helpful to do cortical uh, cortex 
stimulation of the brain uh, for movement at the same time as peripheral stimulation. Um, is there, um, do you see that as being an advantageous system for potential uh, exploitation of um, this plasticity of the entire system? That's an excellent question. I mean, the work that was presented in, in several occasions by Kurkin and the group uh, from Lausanne and Geneva, uh, in combination with some of the work that is coming from activating, so stimulating the upper motor neuron in general, uh, regions that are above the lesion, with uh, a tonic stimulation, in or in, not necessarily even electrical stimulation. It may be also that you use some laser or you use, you know, other techniques to activate that, is changing the excitability of cells. And decreasing the excitability of cells will be definitely a contribution to the cortical excitability and possibly cortical plasticity, which are beneficial. Studies that were done in co co uh, combining uh, the stimulation that you were using, transcranial magnetic stimulation, uh, that are synchronized, synchronized with the peripheral stimulation definitely affect that. It's studied by Natalie Kirsting and Wolpaw and other. They demonstrated that you can make great changes in the eight three plexi legs and by that facilitate the walking extremely well. So that combination is a therapeutic modality is extremely effective. So uh, using the direct electrical stimulation of the brain, which no one really showed what are the effects, is also facilitating the excitability of the cortical cells. So, and that is something that is uh, more practical compared to the transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is not a small system that you can carry when you're walking and exercising. Uh, too much technology is a little problematic for the person. So if you have too much of that technology, then it's difficult to actually do. The concentration of a person, the taking the intention of a person, and uh, mental involvement in the execution of tasks is equally or even more important than everything else that we do. So my experience and what I read in papers is electrical stimulation, if it is applied just as an exercise, you know, go risk test or risk collection, doesn't really do it very much. But you include this into the function, so I go here and I take a cup, and with this cup I can drink. I'm greatly motivated actually not to spill especially if this is something hot or cold, and to drink something because I'm thirsty. So that is activating the muscles that I have, and if this is synchronized with stimulation and the robot, then this is something which is really a function. So this is like driving a car, you know, turning the steering wheel and pressing the gas pedal. If you don't have the feedback from that and you don't see what you're doing, it's not really effective. So if you're driving a car and you're nice, then you know when your car starts sliding that you have to do something and you learn what you need to do. So learning is something that comes through error, trials and errors. So trials and errors, you have to do the function. And if you do the function, then it might work very well. I don't know if I answer, but to, to just to make a very short of that. So combining the stimulation of uh, structures which are above that. Corky uh, demonstrated this extremely well with his colleagues on rest. I don't think that rats demonstration is really meaningful because rats are the animals who recover from everything. And they can live in absolutely everything. On the set, this is a quadrupedal locomotion, which is completely different compared to bipedal locomotion. So the mechanisms are different. If you look at the principles of neuroscience, you will see that at the end, Jim Ward and Kier Pearson, they said that, you know, we can learn something from central pedal generator, but we, have, we cannot translate directly to bipedal locomotion. But other studies, that are coming these days uh, for Roger Edgerton and the group in California combined with Salara here showed, and I'm sure that some of the work that uh, my uh, person who spoke with, Jim Meyer, is using. And Dimitrievich worked on that. If you stimulate spinal cord above the lesion, you're actually facilitating some of the mechanisms which are central pattern generator. And then if you have add to that basic stimulation of periphery, we may end up with an extremely nice combination. Thank you very much, Diane, for uh, attending the conference and replacing Lana. Thank you very much for your time and for the, for the chance you gave me to talk today. Thank you, Diane. Okay, bye.